Well, well, well. Look where we are. This is it. This is it right here, people. This is reacting to the Foolish 50. Back in March, I ranked who I thought were going to be the top 50 players in MLB. We're going to go through player by player, talk about where I got it right, talk about where I got it wrong. Uh, I will be doing a follow-up to this where ultimately sort of try to answer the question of did I do better than MLB Network because that's kind of a big thing for the Foolish 50 was you know providing an alternative and if I'm going to provide an alternative I would hope it was at least as good so uh, we're going to go player by player but first I just want to say a few words above me you can see it right there right above me just kind of a quick general guide, you know, it shows the average player who plays a full season is going to be worth about two war. Uh, for a catcher, it might be a little bit less because for a catcher, a full season, you know, might be 450 plate appearances, whereas for a position player, it might be 600. Um, you know, if you wanted to be a top 100 player by war this year, you could have had 3.3 F4. Uh, if you want to be top 50, bump that up to 4.3. If you want to be top 10... 5.8. Now, I want to be very clear about something, because you're seeing these numbers. It's just, it's a very, very loose guide. I think it's good to remember that war definitely has a margin of error. I think once you get to a point where we're talking about differentials of less than one war, it really doesn't mean much, which is to say, for example, um, you know, if you had 3.9 F war, you could be the 75th, uh, you know, player by F4 in 2021, if you had 4.8, you could be the 35th. But, you know, you're still within 0.9 war of one another, and war just really isn't that precise. So I would not say with the utmost confidence that, you know, a 3.9 F4 player is worse than a 4.8 F4 player. So I think it's helpful as far as, like, building out tiers for sure, but if you want to, you know, differentiate within those tiers of players... You're going to have to get way more precise because I think generally at face value, the difference between, let's say, the 60th best player in MLB and the 40th best player in MLB, it's really not going to be that much, guys. But the difference between the 20th best player in MLB and the best player in MLB, yeah, I mean, you're going to see you know, a pretty sizable gap there. I think that's important to keep in mind. I think just in general, I would say as we go through this list, the difference between the 40th best and the 60th best and the, and the 60th best and the 90th best, you know, it's, it can get fairly nuanced. So let's, you know, let's just definitely keep that in mind. War is going to be a shortcut that we use for sure, but it is far from the be-all end-all. All right, let's kick it off here with number 50 on the list. That would be Mr. Brandon Woodruff. And I got to say immediately, without looking at any numbers, I'm really happy with this pick. Um, in terms of debating, like, you know, who to start off the list with, I really like the idea of starting off with Woodruff at 50 because um, MLB Network did not rank him in their top 100, much less top 50, top 100. And I was here to say, Brandon Woodruff is a top 50 player in MLB. There were a couple players, you know, central division type players that I was really, um, you know, debating. Maybe Kyle Hendricks would be 50th. Maybe Kenta Maeda would be 50th. Maybe Sonny Gray, Luis Castillo, those guys. I ultimately went with Woodruff, and I think for the most part, it really paid off. I think this is a huge win for me over MLB Network. I think I'll definitely be mentioning it when I think there's, you know, a huge discrepancy in rank between the two, you know, who ended up right. In this case, I win, um, but it's uh, I've won the battle. So, um, you know, out of sheer curiosity here, uh, Brandon Woodruff was worth 4.7 F4. That would have uh, put him, you know, probably between, you know, 35 and 50. So I uh, don't really have a problem with that. I will say for Woodruff, too, he's such a ground ball pitcher. He can he can outperform his FIP. Um, you got to keep that in mind with him. But, yeah, Brandon Woodruff, great pitcher. However, you know, at the same time, could argue, well, I mean, I don't even think you could argue it. I think you could just outright say it. He wasn't the best pitcher on his team. Boy, was he good, though. And, I mean, 5.7 baseball reference war is really nice. You know, that's aided by a 2.56 ERA. Woodruff, you know, he gave you the 30 starts, the 180 innings. 
he just kind of got the ground. Nine wins, ten losses. But terrific season. No regrets on Mr. Brandon Woodruff. All right, next man up on this list was Mr. Brandon Lau. And he was kind of interesting because he was the only representative on the Rays. I'm not like a Rays hater by any means. I feel like I usually give them, you know, good cred uh, as far as my predictions generally go. I, I try not to do that thing that everyone does and underrate them. Uh, but the Rays, once again, were, uh, you know, best team in the American League, at least regular season. Uh, didn't really have it in the postseason. But yeah, I mean, Brandon Lau, you know, he's the sole representative. But the Rays are a team, I think, that are generally, you know, lacking star power and make up for it in just depth. Just a lot of a lot of good players, you know, and he's definitely one of them. As far as how Brandon Lau did this year, you know, coming in, putting him at number 49. Um, he, I'm looking for him. He was uh, uh, the 15th best hitter by F4 with 5.2, so that would have put him, you know, right out outside top 20. Um, you know, there's not as much to say about Brandon Lau, I feel like, because, you know, MLB Network ranked him at 53, I ranked him at 49, so it's not a big difference, but I think just generally with Brandon Lau, I can say he had a great season, you know, um, he's, he's one of the most underrated players in the game, I think. I mean, this guy had a 142 OPS+, plus in 149 games, you know, while playing second base. I mean, that's, he's wild. And he's, he's just, ever since he hit the big leagues, he's just always been good. He's just always been really, really good. So way to go, Brandon Lau. You know, I think when I make this list again next year, he's got a chance to move up it. But generally, I think I, I, you know, I nailed him here. But I also don't think MLB Network did anything wrong. We're, we're right next to each other. Number 48 was a really, really funny one for me. I want to tell you guys about this ranking of Jose Abreu. As you can imagine, you know, this guy was the reigning AL MVP, and there were some people that were really unhappy with this ranking. They wanted him to be, you know, just way, way higher on the list. MLB Network ranked him at 31. What I really wanted to do was not rank Jose Abreu at all. I was pretty confident that he wasn't going to be a top 50 player, and I just kind of tossed him on the end here just to kind of give him his due to acknowledge that uh, MVP season. But yeah, this was one of those things where I I wish I was more courageous because I knew deep down, you know, he wasn't going to be a, a top 50 player uh, in the league this year. I'm just going to, you know, go through the... And look, F4 is not everything. F4 is not everything. We already did that speech. But I mean, I'm just, I'm looking for him here. Um, yeah, I mean, he was he was 82nd by hitter F4. That's not even including the pitcher. So uh, just not a top 50 player, not going to be on the list next year. And it's still sort of a victory for me over MLB Network because they did rank him a good bit higher than I did. Um, and yet at the same time, this is somewhat of a failure on my part because if I really wanted to be courageous and right, what I could have done is just not rank him in the top 50 at all. I, I, I was kind of appeasing the crowd on that one. Next up was Clayton Kershaw, and I think this was a really interesting year from Kershaw in general. Like, I feel like it was pretty indicative of where he's at at this point in his career. I'm just going to go ahead, just as a spoiler, and say there were a lot of pitchers that I ranked ahead of Kershaw that I felt like people in general weren't too happy with. Um, you know, among those might have been his teammates, uh, you know, Walker Bueller. Trevor Bauer, also um, Max Scherzer, who ended up being his teammate by the end of the year. But yeah, I think with Kershaw, you know, um, he didn't get a full season in. Let's let's go baseball reference here. So he didn't get a full season in. He started, um, you know, 22 games. His ERA was 3.55. Honestly, though, his FIP was 3. And it was actually his lowest FIP in a season since 2016. So I think really... When I say this season was indicative of where Kershaw's at, I think just in general for his career going forward, there's going to be a lot of load management. And what that means is, you know, he's probably not going to throw 200 or even, I would say, not even 180 innings in a season. I think it's just, for him, it's going to be, you know, he's going to be a really good pitcher on like a rate basis. Like his, I'm sure his ERA is going to be good. Um, but yeah, but I, I just, he's not, He's not 2011 to 17, and I, you know, I, if I make this list again next year, you know, I feel like he will be ranked around here. He'll, he'll be ranked around 47 where I had him this time around, but maybe he'll be ranked, 
you know, 57th, and then he won't be on the list at all. But that, that doesn't mean he actually moved that much, like we said before. It's not much of a difference between, like, the 50th and 60th best player in MLB. There's really not. So, with Kershaw, um, feel feel fine about him at 47. I, I'm just curious to see, once I start building out this list for next year, if he's on it at all. So next up was 46, Nelson Cruz. MLB Network had him at 41. So we were, you know, basically on the same page right there. This is a hard guy to rank because, you know, coming into 2021, this guy had just done nothing but rake the last couple years. And yet, at the same time, um, guy, he's so old. (laughs) You know, at some point, you know, the aging curve is going to take over for him. Um, But honestly, in in 2021, he was still really, really good. And I'll say this as well. With DHs, you know, I'm not really interested in playing the F4 game. That's not really where I'm at with it. If I'm talking about ranking a DH, it might be wise for me just to look at qualified hitters and sort by WRC+, you know, and and see where he he ultimately ended up. And um, for Nelson Cruz, he was the 46th best hitter. By WRC plus, he had a 122 WRC plus. I would say if you're a DH with that kind of performance, you're probably not a top 50 player in the game. Um, but I mean, it was it wasn't a disaster season for him either. I think I would probably put him in the top, you know, around top 100, just not top 50. So this was kind of a miss for me. Um, and yet at the same time, you know. If I'm going to miss, I would at least rather miss, you know, in a way where MLB Network missed just a little bit more. So, I, you know, I got nothing against Nelson Cruz. I think what he's done is great. But I imagine when I build out this list for next year, um, he's, he's not going to be on it. But he's still, you know, he's still a good DH. You know, Max Muncy at 45, this guy got just so unlucky in the regular season in 2020. You know, he really, of all like the small sample size, like weird Babbitt, like just weird stuff happening, guys, I mean, he was one of the most prominent. So some people were actually like surprised to see Muncy still on the Foolish 50. But I mean, I think this past season really just, you know, delivers on the fact that he is at a bare minimum a top 50 player. But I think what's really going to happen is when I start start building up this list for next year, he, he's going to move up. And, and the reason I say that is because, you know, for example, this guy, Max Muncy, looking for him, you know, he, he had a 4.9 F4, um, you know, which would have put him, you know, closer to like 35th. And he, you know, he got hurt right at the end of the year and, and he really slumped bad. in in September before that, but with Muncy, this guy was like a legit NL MVP candidate for most of the summer, so, um, you know, he could definitely move up on this list, I could see him being in the 30s next year for sure, but yeah, he's a great player, and uh, MLB Network had him ranked at 45th, so I was never going to make any ground on them either way, you know, in many ways, this is a comparison, me versus MLB Network, in this case, we were on, I mean, literally the exact same page. Max Muncy's a good player, and it really doesn't make that much of a difference to me whether he's 50th or 30th. You know, it's just he is a top 50 player, and so I'm happy to have him on my list. We got another Dodger, and again, like with Muncy, MLB Network and I are kind of on the same page here. I put Walker Bueller at 44 overall, and he had a great season. I mean, he was the fourth best pitcher by F4 this season. You know, his his F4 would have put him probably somewhere in the teens among all players overall. I do think, you know, with Bueller, as far as like his ERA goes, his ERA was incredibly low. It was 2.47. A little bit of luck in there, I think for sure. Um, but, I mean, he's a, he's a great pitcher. He had a great season. I was... Um, a little bit low on him, I would say, coming into this year. So, you know, he's got, um, you know, he's, he's going to move up the list, basically. I if, if I was, you know, wanted to be more accurate, you know, I should have ranked him in the 30s or the 20s or something like that, I would imagine. So, uh, great job, Walker Bueller. I was a little bit off on you. I think I underrated you just a little bit. But again, you know, I, I don't feel like, even so far when I've missed... I feel like I haven't missed, like, terribly yet, so, but I'm sure I will soon. Yeah, 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 that, this was a miss. This was, he was bad. Jeff McNeil, I I don't really know why Jeff McNeil was bad. I haven't looked into it, like, maybe there's something in the batted ball data or whatever, but I thought 
really Jeff McNeil had proven that his, I would say, unique uh, in today's game, plate approach was was doable in this league, and I mean, it just it just didn't work for him this year. Like this guy had gone one thirty eight, one forty three, one thirty in terms of OPS plus, and then he just comes in and drops an eighty six. He was a below average hitter this year in a, across uh, one hundred and twenty games. Um, Jeff McNeil just you know he, he won a top fifty player this year. He won't even close. So this is a miss. This you know this is. Is a miss. There's there's really not much else to say there. Uh, MLB Network had him ranked at 35th, so in some ways, I guess you could argue they missed more than I did. Um, but yeah, it's it's a miss. Uh, I I wanted to give Jeff McNeil credit for what he'd done the previous three seasons, and it just it didn't really culminate into anything in 2021. I I, I would love to see him come out in 2022 and just get back on track. I think that is a possibility still. I'm gonna keep it real with y'all. Ketel Marte at 42, I I have no problems with it. Ketel Marte, when he played this year, was excellent. I think maybe people need to understand that this guy, 143 OPS plus, OPS over 900 across 90 games. This is a great player, and he's going to be tough to rank coming off, you know, what was a little over half a season, but, you know... I'm glad I had him in my foolish 50. Um, as far as the nuances of where I could have put him, you know, 50 versus 40 versus 30, you know, I don't know. But he's there. I think he's great. And there's really no other notes. I just want to see him stay healthy and, and you know, put up a full season. Because, uh, I mean, when he played last year, really, really good. I mean, he, 318 batting average, 377 on base, 532 slugging. He's a really, really good player. I mean, that's you know, there's not really much else to say. And he still just he just turned 28 two weeks ago. He's young. I gotta say, this is a win for me, relatively speaking. I think when I when I talk about wins and you know hits and misses, there's gonna be some degree of relativity. But with Carlos Correa, me putting him at 41, and MLB Network putting him at 56, and the season he just had, it's a win for me. You know, I'm the guy who is higher on Correa, and I think he he definitely delivered overall I mean he was he had 5.8 you know f4 this year which would have put him at you know 10th in the league so um you know with him it's always you know the talent's there and he can be streaky he can be injured so you have to kind of find a balance between what's Correa's floor and what's his ceiling so I'm not really too mad about this ranking but also, I, th- I think it goes without saying that I put him at as the 41st best player, you know, for 2021. And in reality, he was closer to top 10. So we'll leave it at that. Carlos Correa had a great season. He's going to make, you know, like a, a bajillion dollars this winter. Number 40, Will Smith. I want to give some credit here. I really want to give some credit here. MLB Network had him at 50th. I thought that was a very progressive sort of ranking on Mr. Will Smith, who is just, you know, just continues to emerge as a star, possibly a superstar in today's game. This guy, for a catcher, he is such a good hitter. Like, let's look at catchers with at least, you know, 300 plate appearances, sort by WRC+, and he, he's fourth with 130 behind Mike Zunino, Buster Posey, Yasmani Grandal. This guy, and I, you know, especially when you consider his age compared to those guys, and, and you know, Salvador Perez as well, it's pretty easy to project him to be, you know, the top offensive catcher going forward. Just thinking about where the other players are on their aging curve. So, um, I mean, he's not, you know, a defensive stud by any means, but Will Smith's a great player. I'm happy I had him on my list. I do think he's a top 50 player in MLB. Um, as far as where he could be ranked next year, I don't think he's going to move that much. And I, that's, that's a victory for me. You know, I think when you're talking about me not really having to move a player too much when I do next year's list, that's kind of a win. That kind of means I was right all along. So Will Smith, great player, really just a great hitter for a catcher. And honestly, I think the defense is coming along as well. It's, it's better than it was maybe when he first broke into the league. So yeah, I mean, I, I think very highly of him, and, you know, obviously I ranked him 
you know, better than MLB Network did. But, I mean, that was kind of always going to be the case because I'm just a Will Smith fan. So I just want to say shout-outs to them for having him in the top 50 at all. Number 39, Michael Conforto. That's guy. There's really not much else to say. It's a miss. He had a really bad season. And, you know, there's no reason why he can't get his career back on track, but he had a bad season. He was really not anywhere near a top 50 player in this league. Let's go baseball reference just to kind of get a glimpse of what it was like. You know, 101 OPS plus. So he's a league average hitter. Um, defensive metrics didn't care for him. But yeah, I mean, at best, this guy was like an average starter in this league. I'm going to say that's at best. So not really close to a top 50 player in 2021. MLB Network had him at 34. So it's another case where, you know, if I'm going to miss... I hope MLB Network misses a little bit more, and that was the case. But yeah, this is this is no good. Uh, sorry, Michael Conforto. I had really, I was really on the Michael Conforto bandwagon after he had a great short in 2020, and uh, maybe I maybe I overreacted to that just a little bit too much. I don't know. Jordan Alvarez is a really interesting one because he had a good regular season, but I almost feel like this postseason. He is reasserting that he is one of the best hitters on the planet. And I want to say, you know, up front, this is a regular season list. You know, this, I wouldn't really put too much on uh, postseason performance overall, but no doubt, like this past month, he has, you know, entered the national spotlight again after, you know, what was basically a lost 2020 season. And, uh, you know, he's a DH. And as I said before, DHs, I don't, I'm not caring about the war as much. I just, they're hitters, you know? I want to see how they hit. And so among qualified hitters, Jordan Alvarez this year was 16th in WRC+. Plus. Uh, he hit nearly 300, if you if you care about that kind of thing. Um, oh, wait, no, he didn't. He hit 277. I was looking at Crawford. But yeah, 138 WRC+. Plus. I think this is another one of those cases where when I'm building out the list for next year, um, you know, I'm not going to have to move him too much. He's going to be right around this sort of range. And so that's a win for me. And I got to say, it's a, it's a fat L. It's a big fat L for MLB Network to not have him in their top 100 going into this year. I don't know if that was just some sort of oversight, but man, they, you guys biffed that. He's, he's such a good hitter. That, that's a big mistake, I think. You know, number 37 was Giancarlo Stanton, and I almost feel like this mirrors Alvarez a lot. I put outfielder question mark on this. I don't really know why. I don't know why. He's a DH. He did play a little bit of outfield this year, but he is a DH. And among, you know, qualified hitters with Mr. Stanton, where's he at? You know, he's he's 20th. So he's, he's close to Jordan Alvarez range in that case. Um, you know, obviously there's not a defensive component to his game to really speak of as a DH, you know, with Stanton, it was always going to be about, is he going to play, you know, and with Stanton, if we just hop on baseball reference here real quick, you can see even like, you know, 2019, 2020, as small of a sample size this is, I mean, he was hitting well when he played, you know, but yeah, he basically just had, you know, back-to-back -back seasons where he didn't really play much in the regular season. And then what happens in 2021? Well, he stays healthy for the full year. And really with the Yankees, their offense was basically Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stanton. Those were like, those guys were the pillars of that offense. And then everything else was just kind of, I don't know, you know, it, it just went, it went great. Those guys were great. The other, the other bats in that lineup, ugh. So again, you know, MLB Network had him at 97. I think maybe just... I think maybe a lesson here is that, you know, past injuries don't always predict future injuries. And, you know, I think I even stated in the video right here, you know, Giancarlo Stanton isn't going to exit the top 50 when he doesn't play. He's going to exit the top 50 when he plays badly. And that just simply, that simply just hasn't happened for him over the years. I mean, he just, he hits when he plays. And look at his postseason stats now with the Yankees. They're ridiculous. He has 1,100 OPS. So... Um, yeah, I, again, uh, I feel like I did good on this one and at MLB Network didn't, but you know, there's going to be definitely ones where MLB Network gets the best of me like this one right here. Number 36, Aaron Nola, Aaron Nola 
had he just had a weird year, you know. Um, with Aaron Nola, two strike counts were kind of the bane of his existence. And the other thing that was sort of the bane of his existence, besides not being able to put hitters away on two strike counts, was there were elements of luck. Um, you know, Philly's obviously not a great defensive team. But I think with Nola, and also could the pitchers here, with Nola, it's really interesting because he was actually the 13th best pitcher by F4. So you got to keep in mind with F4, the main component is FIP. So his FIP was really good. His FIP was 3.37. His ERA was 4.63. So a huge discrepancy here between FIP and ERA. But yeah, this I would ultimately have to say this was definitely a miss for me. Um, you know, MLB Network didn't have him ranked in their top 50. I was going all in on Aaron Nola this year. And what I really should have done is go all in on Zach Wheeler, you know? Um, but yeah, I like to know a lot because uh, I think he's I think he's a workhorse. I think he's one of the few pitchers in the league who has a chance to throw, you know, close to 200 innings in a season. He threw 180 this year and he wasn't even really good. So, you know, he could still go 190, 200 if he's good. But yeah, I think Aaron Nola, not nearly as bad as his ERA would suggest, but also you know, possibly jumping the gun as far as putting him in the top 50 after he had a really, really good 2020. Ryu. Hyunjin Ryu, number 35. This was a tough one, guys. I mean, I really, I really want to make a statement here by, you know, putting Ryu with a pretty aggressive ranking overall. And, you know, there was a, a solid basis to it, I would say. You know, from, from 2018 to 2020... This guy had an ERA of 2.3. And I know, you know, the FIP was closer to 3, but this guy, you know, for three seasons had an ERA of 2.3. That's insane. And then this year, it just it just didn't quite work out for him as much. He was just a very, I would say he was average. You know, he was, a, he was just an average pitcher this year. Not, you know, really what you would expect from someone that you would rank in the top 50, much less 35. So this is a miss for me. And I was a little bit more into him than MLB Network, although we were certainly within the same range. So it's a miss. Wouldn't be surprised if Ryu bounces back. But yeah, that's there's really not that much else to say there. We've got ourselves another catcher here with JT Realmuto. And I think once again, we got to remind ourselves that, that catchers don't really play by the rules. They don't play by the F4 rules. You know, they're they're really hard to assess on a statistical level compared to basically every other position in the game, I would say. So, um, you know, JT Realmuto was my second ranked catcher. I won't spoil you on my first, but you could probably guess it. And um, yeah, MLB Network, we were we were all on the same page there. I, I had him 34. MLB Network had him 33, so there's not really much to say there. With Realmuto, what I will say is, you know, the only other catcher to qualify for the batting title besides Salvador Perez was Real Mudo. So Real Mudo is like a real workhorse catcher, and that really does mean a lot to me. I think you'd probably tell that from the Molina video. And also with Real Mudo, he was fourth in catcher F war behind Zunino, Smith, and Posey. And yet also, those numbers are so close, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.9. 4 I mean, there's really, you know... He could, st you know, a lot of people had him pegged as the best catcher in baseball coming into this year, and he still could be that going forwards, I think. I, you know, um, I think with Real Mudo, my thing is, I just, you know, I just feel like he has the monster season within him. And it wasn't this year. He's been playing it around, you know, a really consistent, like, good level for the last. I don't know, like five or six years, it seems like. I mean, look at these numbers from 2016 to 2021. He's kind of going out there and doing the same thing every year. And and that's great. But also with Real Mudo, I just feel like he has the monster season within him. Like he, he could just go out and, you know, put up a, I don't know, a 140 OPS plus. I really feel like he's capable of that. Um, but it wasn't this year. So... Really not too much else to say on Real Mudo. Uh, I imagine when I build this list next year, he moves down a little bit, but probably not a ton. Marcelo Zuna. This is not an easy one to talk about because, you know, with all these players on this list, it's like, you know, you just go, you look at their numbers, you talk about their season, blah, blah, blah. I tend to try to address the elephant in the room, so I'll make it quick. Marcelo Zuna played... 
48 games this year, and when he played, he was bad. He had a 68 OPS plus, 645 OPS. He was bad. Like, And, I mean, this guy doesn't really have a defensive component to his game to speak of. So if he doesn't hit, he's real bad. Um, and then, you know, he got injured. He went on 60-day IL, and then he was arrested for domestic violence. You know, there's really not too much to say. I mean, when he played, he was bad, and then he got hurt, and then he got arrested, and then he was on administrative leave for the rest of the year, so he didn't come back. He still has three more years left on his contract. It's It seems, you know, trivial to some degree, you know, to talk about it, but... Um, you know, in this context, he, he, when he played, he was bad. And so I would probably just leave it at that. He's not a top 50 player in MLB. And, uh, yeah, not, not a great ranking. You know, you can't predict, um, you know, that someone's going to get arrested. You can't predict injury for the most part, I would say. Um, but what I try to predict is performance on the field. And in this case, I failed because again, when he played, I mean, really bad. Like, it was going to be hard. He was pretty much never going to salvage the season into a top 50 season, even if he played every game. Max Scherzer, 32. Like with Ozuna, by the way, uh, same, really just the same sort of range with MLB Network. We were on roughly the same page, so not too much to say there. Scherzer, you know, he'll, he had some surprises. I'll put it that way for Mr. Mad Max. I was not really surprised by anything he did. In Washington, I was like, yep, that's about what I was expecting. And then he went to L.A. And with L.A., he merged as a you know, potential Cy Young candidate. He was so good there. His ERA and his FIP were below two across 11 starts, which gave him a 2.46 ERA on the year. Um, you know, among pitchers, if we could pull it up, please. Among pitchers, he uh, had the fifth most F war. He had the F war befitting of maybe... 25th best in the league so you know I didn't really it, maybe I underrated him just a teeny bit but again myself MLB Network yeah close enough close enough number 31 was Mr. Yasmani Grandal but perhaps most noteworthy I had him ranked as the first the best catcher in MLB coming into 2021 and you gotta keep in mind this was pretty much you know Grandal versus Real Muto. That's what we were doing last March. There weren't other players really on the radar. We weren't talking about, you know, Posey and his resurgence. That that caught people by surprise. So this was really a Grandal versus Real Muto type of thing. And ultimately, I'm happy to have picked Grandal in this one. I'll tell you why. Because even though Grandal, you know, he missed games. You know, he played 93 games, full season, you know, for a catcher, you might expect like 120. But when he played... We're talking about players with at least 300 plate appearances in MLB in 2021. He was fourth in the whole league, not among catchers, in the whole league in WRC+. Okay, it goes Harper, Guerrero, Soto, Grandal. That's how good of a hitter he was. And look, the defensive metrics, the framing, it, I'll, be, I'll keep it real with you. You know, it slipped. He's, he's getting a little bit older, but he had such a great season as a hitter when he played you know, I, I really just, I have, you know, no doubts that this was the correct call at the time. MLB Network had him ranked at 49th, they had him ranked at 31st, so we had some degree of disagreement there, and so I'm, I'm happy to have picked Grandal over Real Mudo. Uh, as far as who I'm going to pick as the best catcher going into 2022, I don't know. I feel like there's more, there's definitely more horses in that race. Paul Goldschmidt had a really nice year. I mean, that there's really not too much else to say there. He had a really nice year. Adam ranked 30th, MLB Network 32. So we're on the same page there. Guy had a nice year. You know, he, um, among hitters, was ranked 21st in F War. He slashed 294, 365, 514. Good for him. I mean, this is probably about right. You know, for me, him being a first baseman, even though I think he's a good defensive first baseman, that does limit his upside to some degree because, uh, you know, defense you know, defensive value overall is not going to be as big for his game, or at least have as high a ceiling as like a great defensive shortstop would. But yeah, overall, I got to say, you know, pretty happy with uh, Paul Goldschmidt this year. And if anything, maybe underrated him by a few spots, but not by a lot of spots. Number 29, my dear friend, some would even say my best friend, Lucas Giolito, 
Um, you know, it's tough to talk about because I think even at the time of making this Foolish 50, we were at least talking about doing the baseball bits together. But yeah, I think with Giolito, it was about looking at his age, looking at what he'd done you know, over the last couple years, and just projecting possibly a bigger step forward. You know, when I put him at 29 coming into this year, I was thinking this guy's going to be like Cy Young candidate with like a decent chance to win it coming out of the AL. And, you know, if you look at MLB Network's rank of 69th, you know, where we had a huge gap, um, I think they definitely get the last laugh here. I still think Lucas is great. I still think his ceiling is, you know, that he could win a Cy Young award someday. This just wasn't quite his year. You know, this wasn't, you know, the type of progression I was really anticipating. And, you know, his his teammates had great years. You know, Lance Lynn had a good year. Um, Rodon had a crazy good year. But yeah, uh, this is, it's, I would say it's premature, if anything, on Lucas Giolito. So when I build out this list next year, I think he's got a chance to be one of those guys that's borderline top 50 or possibly not on the list at all. I don't know yet, but... I would call it a miss, and I would call it a win for MLB Network, quite, uh, quite frankly, even though I really thought they screwed the pooch when they ranked him at 69th. Nice. Number 28, Trey Turner. I think this is going to be one of those, it's going to be one of the most interesting assessments from this entire video because there have been times where, you know, I ranked a player maybe 45th, and then maybe they were like 30th in war or something like that, and I could say, well, maybe I was off by a little bit, but, you know, you get the idea. You know, I was definitely within range. I think with this one, me having put Trey Turner at 28 and MLB Network having put him at 26, I think we both have to take the L. I think it's a miss. You know, Trey Turner this year um, was actually the top hitter by F4. He had 6.9. And this is kind of what I'm talking about. If you look again at the tier list above me, you know, I had Trey Turner ranked at 28. So maybe at that point I'm projecting him to have, you know, uh, you know, maybe a, a four and a half, five war season. Um, but, you know, for him, you know, the difference between a 28 and like a 48 still might not be that great. But, but ultimately what Trey Turner had was like a top five season. And that's a really big miss. Trey Turner was like, you know, probably a top five at a bare minimum a top 10 player in MLB this year, in my opinion. So it's a miss to have him this low, you know, 28th coming into 2021, when, when in reality, I believe he produced a top 10 season. So it's a miss. I underrated him. Um, you know, I thought this was, uh, you know, a pretty accurate rating at the time I, I handed it out. And I, I, yeah, I underrated him. MLB Network underrated him. And I, I imagine when I build out this list next year, he's going to be top 20. So he's going he's gonna to really move up. Trevor Bauer, 27. This was an interesting one for people because I think they were surprised at just how much credit I gave him over his teammates Bueller and Kershaw. And honestly, Bauer had kind of a weird year when he pitched this year. Um, and by that I mean, you know, he had like his innings were great. And, you know, for me, volume in a starting pitcher was so important. And the and reason I went you know, so aggressive on Bauer was because I knew he could throw 200 innings in the season. Like I knew he could do that. And I feel like he was on pace to do that. But also his ERA was 2.59, but his FIP was 4.03. So we had a huge discrepancy between some of the peripherals and his actual ERA. Um, so I think on a performance basis, you know, some of my ideas were being realized and some of my ideas, you know, were, were very shaky as far as ranking him, you know, uh, very high, you know, among all starting pitchers. Um, but what ultimately happened, as we all know, is that he, uh, you know, was put on administrative leave. He's under uh, investigation for sexual assault, and and that ended his season. Um, but yeah, I think you know, as a player, it, it's tough to say if if my ranking had too much accuracy. Maybe I nailed it. Maybe I didn't. Um, but yeah, that's really not, you know, that's not really what's important. So I'll acknowledge it. Trevor Bauer, I ranked him 27th. I really liked him as a player coming into this year. Uh, and we all know how that turned out. Okay, number 26, Xander Bogarts. This is one of those where, you know, looking back at it, maybe I just don't appreciate consistency enough because 
this guy just it's just every year with this guy you know what I mean it's just it's just every year with this guy and I feel like you know maybe I nitpick the shortstop defense almost too much but it is just every year with this guy because uh, let's put it this way you know let's look at the last three years across MLB Sandra Bogarts is third in F4, and I had him ranked 26th coming into this year. MLB Network 25th. You know, it's tough, but I would say I underrated him and that I should probably have him um, top 20 going into next year. You know, at a bare minimum, he deserves to move up a few spots. Yeah. But again, you know, where I was on pretty much the same ranking as MLB Network, so I don't really lose versus them. But yeah, I mean, Bogarts, yeah, he deserves more credit than I think I gave him with this ranking. I think he's he's probably, you know, he's going to be in the teens. Manny Machado, I had him as 25th. MLB Network had him as 18th. Um, This was a weird year for Machado, I felt like. I don't think he was bad. I want to be very clear on that. I don't think that Manny Machado um, was bad this year, but let's look, you know, at his uh, his F WAR if we can find it. He was thirty second in hitter F WAR at four point four, so he's one of those guys that would have been, you know, around fiftieth in the league. Um, and I had him at twenty fifth, and MLB Network had him at eighteenth. The batted ball stuff on Machado, a lot of it looked pretty good, like a lot of it looked like he got unlucky as far as how well he was crushing the ball like he hit the ball really hard on a consistent basis this year um so I think generally with Machado it's going to be one of those where when I build out this list in 2022 he might move down a few spots like he might be in the 30s um but I feel like I was decently in range and I, you know, again, I was probably a little bit closer to reality than MLB Network in this case. Number 24, you Darvish. I got to take an L here. I was so in on Darvish. I thought, you know, I was like, when the season ends, he's got a really good chance to have like an ERA crown, you know, moving from Wrigley to Petco. It's just how nasty his stuff is. Yeah, I was like, I was so in on Darvish as like a top, top pitcher in this league. And instead what happened is he delivered what I would basically call an average season. He threw 166 innings. He had a 4.22 ERA, 3.9 FIP. It was just very average from him. And I don't, you know, with with, with San Diego, it, they all just seemed to just fall apart because, you know, through, uh, you know, through the end of June, this guy's ERA was 2.44. And then it was like just the wheels came off, you know, so... I still love Darvish. I still think he's great, blah, blah, blah. But this was a miss, and MLB Network had him at 30th, so this was a bigger miss for me than it was for them. Number 23, Francisco Lindor. This is one of those where I'm going to call it a relative win, okay? It's not really a win, but it is a relative win, and here's what I mean by that. Go look for top 50 or top 100 lists going into 2021, not just mine, not just MLB Networks, you know, go look at other YouTubers, go look at, you know, ESPN put one out, go look at ESPN's, you know, top 50 or top 100 players coming into 2021, you know, go back to last March, and I'm telling you guys, I was more pessimistic on Francisco Lindor than than basically all of them. That's what I'm saying right here. I'm not saying he was the 23rd best player in MLB this year. He obviously wasn't. It was not a great season for him. I would also say it wasn't terrible. He wasn't terrible. You know, he was like a league average hitter, and of course he's going to give you, you know, pretty elite defense at shortstop. So he wasn't terrible. But I will say up front that I consider this to be a win because ultimately what I did when I made this ranking was I said I can't put this guy as a top 20 player with just the way he's been trending with the bat, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, you can see it's just, it's just, it's going down, you know? And, um, yeah. And so I don't know if he'll be on the top 50 next year or not. I think it, you know, he, he could be one of those players that's on the borderline because I know he has such a good ceiling as a player. 
Um, but yeah, I actually considered this to be a win and I'm kind of weirdly proud of, of it because I think just compared to the consensus, I was probably more accurate on Lindor than, than a lot of the, the people and publications building out similar lists, you know, last March. Number 22, Bryce Harper, MLB Network also had on number 22. You know, this is one of those, with Harper it's so hard because, and I feel the same way about Machado too, you want to balance out what's the floor of this player and what's the ceiling, you know? And obviously with Harper, I know his ceiling is MVP, right? I mean, I you've seen my video that I made on, you know, Foolish Baseball like a year and a half ago. I know that his ceiling is MVP, and you know what he did? He hit it. I think he's going to be the NL MVP this year. I really do. So for me, ranking him 22nd in, in MLB Network, ranking him 22nd, and him turning out to be the NL MVP, obviously that's a miss. Obviously that's a miss. Obviously when I build out the list next year, he is going to be you know higher. He's going to have a more prestigious rank. Um you know, however, at the same time, I also recognize that this is a player with a decent degree of season-to-season -season volatility, so I almost feel like you can never be 100% right on him, you know, because no one would have put him top five coming into this year, and yet here he is, and you know what, it, you shouldn't be surprised. So, great season for Bryce Harper. Um, you know, if you want me to to seem like I was smart about Bryce Harper, don't watch the Foolish 50. I would say watch the watch the Bryce Harper baseball bits instead. 21, New York Yankees second baseman DJ LeMayhew. I think this is kind of a Lindor situation as well where it's a relative win. Me being uh, just a little bit more pessimistic on a player that underperformed than, than everyone else. Obviously, DJ LeMayhew wasn't even a top 50 player in MLB this year. This really was a kind of a season to forget after being, you know, one of the top, top players in 2019 and 2020. You know, let's, I mean, let's look at the numbers real quick on the Mayhew, just to sort of refresh our memory, not just on what he did this year, but just, you know, in general. This guy was uh, 136 OPS plus in 2019. He was 178 in 2020, and then he's down. He's just a, basically a league average hitter in 2021. So, yeah, just a, just had a very average year, and... You know, with LeMahieu, I don't know uh, if I would rank him in the top 50 for 2022. I don't. But I also know, you know, looking at the MLB Network, ranking him 14, I also know it's a relative win, you know. It, but it's not but it's not an accurate ranking because he was not anywhere near the 21st best player in 2021. I had George Springer at number 20. Uh, MLB Network also had him in number 20, so we're on the exact same page there. This is one of those where... You know, he's just great, you know? <laughs> There's really not much else to say. It's kind of the Bogarts thing where this guy is just so consistent. He's such a great hitter uh, at a premium defensive position. And it's almost like semantics to argue, well, is he the 20th best player in MLB? Is he the 13th best player? Is he the, or the 17th best player? I, You know, I'm definitely, like, within range there on Springer, you know? But um, it's one of those where, look... When I go back and I build the list again for 2022, is he going to move much? No. So does that mean I was, you know, right for the most part? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, I mean, look at Springer's numbers. He's done 150, 141, and 143 on OPS Plus these last three years. Um, and I, I'm, again, with Springer, I think it's, you know... Uh, I know some players are more prone to injury than others, and some positions are more prone to injury than others, but ultimately what I'm going to judge you by is your performance on the field when you're healthy, and that's what George Springer does. He performs when he is healthy and on the field. Nolan Arenado, who I had at 19th, he was like, he was like a paradox this year almost. Like He had a year that was very weird and also very normal. Um... You know, offensively, I wasn't too worried about him moving away from course, and he delivered a 121 OPS plus, which I would describe as, you know, once you park adjust and you go back and you look at some of the numbers he put up as a Rocky, I would say offensively, his performance was um, within the range of expected outcomes. Uh, what was weird about his year was that um, the defensive metrics on him 
um, which are usually just insane, were only just kind of good. And so what happened to Mr. Nolan Arenado is he was actually uh, just a four-war player, which, as you can see on the guide above me, really means he was, like, you know, outside the top 50 in terms of war on the season, which just seems weird to say because, again, it's not like he was, like, a bad hitter this year necessarily. Obviously, the raw numbers are going to go down leaving cores, but the park-adjusted numbers, they didn't go down that much uh, where they did go down. So, yeah, um, it's tough. It's tough. I think if I'm going back and making a list for 2022, he probably doesn't move that much, but maybe he's in the 20s or possibly the low 30s, but probably in the 20s, I would say. So, I don't know. MLB Network had him at 13th. I will say that I definitely missed on some elite third baseman um, a lot more than I did than Nolan Arenado. So there's a little bit of a spoiler, but Arenado, uh, if if it's a miss, it's not a huge miss in my mind. Um, but there are there are some weird third basemen to come. Number 18, Alex Bregman. I almost feel like a sigh of relief on this one. I'll tell you why. When I put Alex Bregman at 18th, especially considering what he'd accomplished in like 2018 and 2019, I felt like I was maybe setting myself up for failure because I feel like there was a pretty good chance he was just going to go out and just be an MVP candidate again, and then I was going to look stupid. Um, instead, what happened for Bregman was he was hurt for a decent amount of the year, and even when he did play, everything was like, pretty well below his career averages. You know, obviously people will love to play the trash can game with that, but I also feel like for him, you know, he has a real potential to be a victim if the ball is uh, dejuiced or continues to be further dejuiced because there was, especially 2019, this guy hit 41 home runs in a season. I mean, he's not like a raw power hitter at all. So, you know, if he can... If in the past he could have, you know, cheated those Crawford boxes, hit a bunch of pulled fly balls and had them go out and that's not happening, then yeah, it's going to be harder for him to slug uh, in this league because he's not just in terms of raw power, how far, how hard he can hit the ball. That's not really um, his game necessarily. So MLB Network had him ranked at 17th, so we were basically on the same page. But um, I, for Breckman, I would say like Arenado, he, you know, um, on a production basis, you know, probably, you know, uh, a top 50 or top at least 100 player, right? Um, and yet at the same time, uh, he was certainly was not the 18th best player in MLB this year. And it's going to be kind of interesting to see where he ends up uh, next year. But again, you know, MLB Network, same thing. So I don't really lose there relatively, although it, it is a miss because I don't think he was anything close to a top 20 player this year. Number 17, Corey Seager. Corey Seager was kind of like an anti-Lindor situation for me. Remember when I said that I was more pessimistic about Lindor than I was, you know, just about anyone out there? Well, with Corey Seager, I was like all aboard the Corey Seager train, choo-choo. I was the conductor, and I was just all in on Corey Seager after what I thought was an amazing 2020 from him. And what happened is he got to uh, the last month of the season and he was like, all right, Bailey, I'm going to bail you out. Because here's the thing about Corey Seager. He's not a great uh, defender um, at shortstop. Um, you know, it, he's just, he's, it's kind of a Bogart situation where he just kind of rakes and also he just kind of stands there. So when I say that, I mean, Corey Seager through August 31st, had a season OPS of 806, and then he just went ballistic in August and finished with a season OPS of 915. So by the end of the year, as an LA Dodger in a, um, in a pitcher-friendly park, he slashed 306, 394, 521 as a shortstop, and, you know, made me look okay, I would say. I mean, he made me look perfectly fine. Maybe not quite like a genius, but... Again, I think when I build out this list next year, he's not moving too much. Um, and he was certainly better than Lindor. I think that was kind of a gutsy thing at the time to put Seager ahead of Lindor. I don't think everyone would have done that. 
Uh, another thing with Seager, again, I mentioned his defensive value isn't nearly as high as uh, a lot of the other shortstops are, but he was the second best offensive shortstop this year by WRC plus trailing only to Tease. So I'll take it there. Um, Again, he's going to make a bunch of money. I guess he'll probably be a Yankee, and um, he's just going to be their Bogarts when he is a Yankee. I had Trevor Story as 16th, so did MLB Network, so we were on the exact same page there, and I love Trevor Story. Um, it's a little bit of the Arenado thing where his offensive numbers slipped just a bit. You know, he went closer to uh, league average as a hitter after being, you know, 127, 120, 120 OPS plus. He was 103. Once you adjust for cores this year, so he was, you know, basically a league average hitter this year. He's still such a great, like, well-rounded player. He steals bases. He's a great uh, defender at shortstop, uh, unlike Corey Seager. I think, you know, if I was, if you were going to ask me the question of was Trevor Story a top 20 player in MLB in 2021, I think the answer is obviously no. Um, but I do still think he's good. And, uh, you know, when I build out this list next year, he will move down, but he's not going to move down a ton. So it's a little bit of a miss, um, but it's not a huge miss. And MLB Network, we had him ranked the same. I actually think this about Trevor Story. I'll give you guys just a, a kind of a little tidbit. I think of all the shortstops that are entering the market right now, you know, Correa, Seager, um, Story, uh, Baez, even, you know, Simeon, if he goes back to playing shortstop, I think as far as who you want to give the long-term deal to, I really think Trevor Story's deal could be a huge value to whoever signs him because there's a chance that he'll be like the fourth or fifth most paid shortstop by like AAV. You know, he'll at least be, uh, you know, at the most, I think, third by AAV on his deal. And yet, if you're talking about just money versus performance, I think he's going to represent a really good value to whatever team signs him. So... Uh, I'm still really optimistic on Story, even if this wasn't quite his contract year, you know, that he was expecting. Number 15, Matt Chapman. This was one of those where I thought I was getting real clever putting him ahead of Arnado. I thought I could make a really neat statement, and I, I hope you guys can at least understand where I was coming from there. And here's where I was coming from. So basically, let's let's do, you know, the, the previous three seasons. So 2018 to 2020, Arenado Park adjusted was a 126 OPS plus, and Chapman, Matt Chapman, that is, um, you know, in those three seasons was a 130. So basically, what I was saying was that, you know, I felt like Chapman was like just a slightly better hitter than Arenado, and yet the exact same quality of defender, which would which would just make him just a little bit better than Arenado, and what happened for Chapman is. His um his offense took a step back, and he was basically just a league average hitter this year, and the strikeouts were just kind of out of control for him. I mean, when you when you reach a point where you're striking out more than thirty percent of your plate appearances, it's going to be hard to be productive. And I think that's what happened at Chapman at the plate. He's going to be tough to grade. His defense is absolutely insane. Um, but I think for me, putting him fifteenth. That's a miss. I think probably MLB Network's 23. That's going to be a relative win for them. Uh, and um, yeah, I don't know where I'm going to put Chapman next year, but it's going to be probably outside the top 20. Aaron Judge, number 14, no regrets. That's all I'm going to say on it. Absolutely no regrets. This guy, you know, I said it in the video. Uh, on a rate basis, on a per game basis, he is better than 14th. However, you know, coming into this year, he had only qualified for the batting title once, and that was all the way back in 2017, so you had to bake in some injury concern. You almost had to assume he was going to play 120 or 130 games, whereas with almost everyone else on that list, you're assuming they're playing 150. So that's what, uh, you know, the thinking was with Judge. And what happened is he played a full season, you know, which again kind of shows you that um, you can't, predict injuries but you also can't predict when someone's not going to be injured um and that's and that's the Aaron Judge story from this year 148 games that's that's great news on a rate basis everything was right in line with his career averages so he was not there was no fundamental change in talent he just played that was the only difference I think a big question for people will be if if is he going to be a top 10 player um given that he just played a full season and 
Uh, I'm hesitant to guarantee it, but it'll definitely be under consideration. I almost feel like he's not going to move much because I feel like I I still have a good idea of who he is, which is a, a great player who I expect to play about 130 games, and you have to you know you have to balance that out either way. Number 13, Freddie Freeman. We talked about Jose Abreu a long time ago, but this was the other reigning MVP. And uh, a couple things about Freddie Freeman. Number one, um, he is the sunshine of my life. Um, so you got to keep that in mind. But I was trying to be objective here. And I put him at 13th. MLB Network put him at 4th. And I feel like I ultimately won that one this year. Basically, Freddie Freeman just has a level. And he's basically the same guy every year. And it's great. That look, look, here he is in 2021. Guess what? It's the same as he was in 2019 and 2018. It's the same guy. And 2020, you know, he j- he got hot for 60 games and he won MVP. And I'm really happy for him. And the Braves are in the World Series. And then obviously I'm very happy about that. But, you know, uh, for Freddie Freeman as a first baseman, uh, great as he is, you know, he's not, uh, he's not, it's just you're, if you're talking about overall value as a player, you know, he's not, I don't think he's not a top 10 player. And, and it'll be Network had him at fourth. By F4 this year, you know, just just out of curiosity, he was 29th among uh, hitters, that is. He was at 4.5. So he would be, you know, potentially uh, in the 40s as far as his, his F war rankings on the season. Um, but, you know, he gets points for uh, consistency too. So I love Freddie Freeman. Uh, not much else to say. And also, I was still probably right to not rank him in the top 10th, despite my uh, undying love for him. All right, I'm back. It's a new dawn. It's a new day for me. You're still watching the same video. So uh, let's just go ahead and start with number 12, Shane Bieber. So Shane Bieber, of course, was coming off a a Cy Young year. Uh, He was the best pitcher in MLB in the abbreviated 2020. And, you know... For him, I think ultimately you can say that he still showed, you know, just like how great a pitcher he is overall. He had a 3.17 ERA, had a 3.03 FIP. It was one of those things where, you know, if he just got a little bit hotter, was able to do it for a full season, he would have been up there in Cy Young contention again with with Cole and Ray. Uh, But unfortunately, he got hurt. And that doesn't really affect my opinion of him overall. I still think he'll probably be you know, within this sort of range, maybe drop a few spots into the teens. But I think uh, Shane Bieber is a really, really, really good pitcher. Uh, And there's not really too much else to say on him, I feel like. Uh, I would point out that he is um, still quite young. He's 26. And um, I think at the very least, it was good for him and his uh, 2022 outlook that he was able to get back and at least get some, like, you know, tune-up type outings at the end of September. I think that bodes well for him going into 2022. I really think the world of this guy, uh, he's hes a really amazing pitcher. He has such a crazy arsenal of pitches, and he's also uh, very efficient in using them. So, yeah, that's Shane Bieber, number 12. MLB Network also had him ranked at number 12. Number 11, I had Garrett Cole, and I remember at the time just feeling like a big debate for me was, you know, do I put Cole ahead of Bieber or Bieber ahead of Cole? I almost put Bieber ahead of Cole. And ultimately, Garrett Cole had a good year. And I think maybe people would forget that based on a couple bad September starts. But this guy's uh, this guy's a legitimate Cy Young candidate for the AL. I still kind of think Robbie Ray is going to win that one. But, I mean, Garrett Cole had 5.3 F4. His FIP was below 3. And... You know, I know the wild card game didn't go well for him, but this is this is a regular season list, and he just uh, you know continues to do really well. He threw 180 innings, which I think is great. I think that's you know sort of the the benchmark for you know a real ace tor- uh, you know workhorse type of starting pitcher is you need to throw 180. He did that, and um, yeah, there's really not too much else to say on him. I feel like you know he's he's Cy Young candidate this year. I had him as the second best starting pitcher, um, and uh, MLB Network uh, also had him at 11. Number 10, Cody Bellinger. Starting to see a lot of synergy here between myself and the MLB Network list. Uh, both had uh, Bellinger at 10, Cole at 11, Bieber 12. But yeah, I think, you know, it's sort of a landmark decision to put someone at number 10 because you are saying, hey, 
this guy's a top 10 player going into 2021. You know, I could have done that with, you know, Judge or Freeman or Bieber or Cole, but ultimately I decided that Bellinger should get that distinction. And, you know, it just kind of goes without saying that this was not his year at the plate, like at all. I think this is, this needs to be sort of like, you know, hammered down for people. Like for someone to win the MVP award in 2019 at the age of 23, and then in their age 25 season, go on to put up this slash line. We're talking about 165 average, 240 on base, 302 slugging, 45 OPS plus. I really think it's unprecedented throughout like all of MLB history to have a regular season this bad at that age, that far removed from uh, winning an MVP award. So it's going to be really hard to figure out what to do with Bellinger because despite this, you know, I feel a temptation to still put him in the top 50 next year. You know, it obviously would be somewhere in the 40s, but I still feel that temptation because uh, I know where his ceiling is. And I also know, you know, he's a good defensive center fielder. So if he gets out there and he has a season like he did maybe in 2018, where he has a 120 OPS plus, but he's also like a gold glove center fielder, you know, that's probably going to be enough to make him a top 50 player in the league. So it's tough. He's, you know, obviously this is a huge miss, but, you know, I just don't see how you could have seen this possibly coming. And MLB Network, again, had him at 10. So, you know, it's a, I mean, it's a colossal miss given how badly he did. And yet at the same time, I, I can't fault myself too much, I feel like. Number nine, Ronald Acuna Jr. I feel like this is actually a slight miss for me. I did get one thing right over MLB Network here, which is that I had Acuna as the best player on the Braves. They had Freeman as the best player on the Braves, um, but they did ultimately still rank Acuna higher than I did. And I really think, you know, just looking at his performance this year, like that was the right move. I mean, Acuna was like going to be, you know, right up there in the MVP race until he tore his ACL. And again, you know, you can't predict someone's going to tear their ACL, but you can try to predict performance on the field. And when he was on the field, I mean, he was he was looking like possibly the best player in baseball. I mean, that's just that's how good he was, uh, you know, for the first half of the season in 2021. I want to take a look at um, just the, the hitting leaderboards here. You know, if we set a minimum plate appearance threshold to 300, kind of like we did with Grandal, you know, Acuna was sixth in WRC plus, and when you, you know, factor in the fact that he's just, he's so quick on the base pass, and he does have, like, defensive value to contribute, um, you know, I mean, this is, this is absolutely a top-tier player in the league. As far as, like, where I could rank him next year, it's going to be difficult because, you know, he's going to be probably coming back, um, you know, in the middle of the season. I don't know if that's going to be May. I don't know if that's going to be July. You know, I, I don't know. And we're also talking about, you know, an explosive young athlete who tore his ACL. And that's, you know, in terms of general athleticism, you hope for, for you know, a full recovery there, but it's not 100% guaranteed. We've come a long way, but it's not, it's definitely not a guarantee. So, um, you know, obviously, as a Braves fan, I love Acuna. I think maybe if anything at nine, I underrated him just a little bit. He could have been pushing into like a top five spot given how well he was playing. Um, but yeah, it's just it's gonna be tough to rank him for next year. I might I might almost have to abstain until I get some idea of when he's actually coming back. All right, so I put Tatis at number eight. MLB Network put him at number six. I think both of these rankings were actually fairly aggressive because you know coming into 2021, uh, Tatis had played you know 143 career games, so he basically had one season's worth of games under his belt and. I think ultimately he showed he is a top 10 player in MLB. If you look at the just F4 leaderboards, he had 6.1, which if you look at the guide above me, yeah, I mean, he was by F4 a top 10 player, and that's impressive, especially considering he only played 130 games. So everyone on this list played, you know, more games than him and had, you know, way more played appearances than him. And so on a rate basis, you know, he's really up there with like the, the top players from this season. I think with Tatis, it's just going to be interesting to monitor, like, what's his defensive contribution going to be? Because I think this year, you know, it, it, he's just proven he's an amazing hitter. You know, he, he had a 166 OPS plus this year. He had 42 home runs in 130 games. I mean, 
you know, this is just absolutely phenomenal stuff. He slugged over 600. But the question is, you know, can this guy be, you know, a league average shortstop? Or is he just going to be like a right fielder? I don't know. I think the long-term defensive outlook for Tatis is actually going to be the most interesting and possibly the most volatile part as far as ranking him. Because, you know, we know he can hit. And I know he can hit. And I'm just curious to see what his contributions outside of that can be long term. All right, number seven, Jose Ramirez. Guys, MLB Network biffed this one. It was 19, is just so disrespectful. Jose Ramirez, you gotta just look at his career. You look at his last five years. Basically, what happened to Jose Ramirez is he has been amazing. Like, you know, kind of like MVP candidate type level every year for the last five years, except for one half of 2019. One half of 2019, he was really bad. And then even in the second half of 2019, uh, like before he got hurt, he was getting back on track. Like he had, um, you know, the second half of 2019, only 44 games, but his OPS was over 1,100. So he's just a phenomenal player. He goes out and performs. I know it's almost like a weird eye test thing because I just feel like you look at him and it's like he doesn't look athletic. And then you look at his numbers and they're just elite. So I'm really of the opinion, and this is a really like hotly contested thing, but I'm really of the opinion that Jose Ramirez is the best third baseman in MLB. As you'll see later on, uh, that wasn't actually my opinion going into the year, but right now he is the best third baseman in MLB. He's one of the top tier players in MLB. He's just so, so good. He had 6.3 F4 this year, which, you know, would put you in the top 10, like I said, with this guy to buff me. Yeah, I mean, I think MLB Network just super disrespectful. Um, and honestly, he should have won MVP in 2020. You know, I, that Jose Abreu won that, but uh, Ramirez absolutely deserved it. He put up the same offensive numbers, but he also had more to contribute in terms of, like, what position he plays on defense and also on the base pass because he can steal bases and he's quick. So Jose Ramirez, great player, absolutely top tier in this league. Uh, I imagine when I build out this list next year, he'll be ranked about the same. Number six, Christian Yelich. MLB Network had him ranked at ninth. And this is one of those where I wanted to be the guy that wasn't going to overreact to 2020. You know, he'd been so good in 2018. He'd be even better in 2019, honestly. And, you know, in 2020, it wasn't his year. So I kind of thought, eh, he talked about the video room, whatever. It's weird not to play in front of fans. I'm sure he'll get back on track in 2021. And then, honestly, he just, he didn't. And I really just don't like the approach in general from Yelich. I feel like it's, like, less aggressive. I feel like it's more trending, like, three true outcome And I feel like Yelich is at his best when he's just putting balls in play because he's a terrific hitter from a Babbitt perspective. And, you know, it's just, it's too many ground balls, too. I mean, the slugging is completely gone. This guy had... 44 home runs and 30 steals in 2019. This year he had nine home runs and nine steals. So it's it's not, it's, you know, the power going away. It's the stolen bases going away. It's the defensive metrics continuing to sort of decline and show that he's just kind of eh, corner outfielder these days. Uh, yeah, I mean, my outlook on Yelich is like, I would say fairly negative given how this past season went. I mean, he was basically just a league average hitter. So I don't know if I'm going to have him ranked in the top 50 and going into uh, 2022. I think it's really telling for me that... So basically, I'll say this. It's really telling for me that Yelich was a 99 OPS plus, so he's like a league average hitter. And then, you know, you look at Bellinger, right? And he was like a 45 OPS plus, so he was way worse than Yelich. Like, Bellinger was way worse than Yelich, and yet... I feel like deep down I have more faith in Bellinger going forward than I do Christian Yelich. So I hope he'll prove me wrong. I know injuries for both, honestly, you know, have been big. That that broken kneecap in 2019 for, for Yelich, I think, you know, was still responsible for how bad he was in 2020. And then I know he's having back problems. And obviously Bellinger's been having on and off injury problems. So, you know, it's kind of tough. I can't really play team doctor there. But, I mean, yeah, Christian Yelich not looking good. And, you know, give MLB Network some credit, I guess, because they were more pessimistic on Yelich than I was. Number five, Anthony Rendon. Here's a guy that I just stuck my neck out for. I planted my flag in the ground and I said, guys, Anthony Rendon is a top five player in MLB. And, you know, based on his track record, um, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, even 2020, he was still really good. 
I really felt happy about that. I was like, he's the best third baseman. In fact, I even think I had him as the best infielder. So I was like, that's what I think of Anthony Rendon. And this year, it was what I would call sort of the killer combination. And the killer combination is when you get hurt, but also uh, when you play, you're bad. That's the, those are the two bad things. Not only did he get hurt, but when he played, he was like, he was bad. He was a 94 OPS plus. He was below average hitter. Um, you know, uh, with, he was below that 100 OPS plus league average. And then his war was zero on reference, so he was just replacement level, basically. But, I mean, look how good this guy had been coming into this year. I think this was just offensively better and more consistent than, um, you know, really any third baseman, certainly more than, you know, like even Arenado or someone like that or Machado. And, uh, yeah, it just blew up in my face. MLB Network had him ranked at 8th. I think this is a guy who, again, is going to be tough to, to grade going forwards. I don't know, you know, it, does he show up in the back half? Does he show up in the 40s again? Uh, I will say for Rendon, I don't like to do, like, the call-in cowherd. What's his motivation? Just blah, 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 blah. He kind of looks disinterested out there in L.A. I, you know, and he's always been a stoic guy, but I just I don't know how this contract is going to work out for them long term. I loved it when he signed it. I was like, yes. LA just got, uh, you know, one of the best players in MLB. And honestly, his 2020, I thought, was really, really good. He had a 418 on base. So 2021, really kind of a bad loss year for Rendon. Uh, and I hope he can get back on track because, honestly, he's one of my favorite players. Number four, Juan Soto. I think the biggest question right now for Juan Soto is, is he the best player overall in Major League Baseball? I think that's a perfectly fine question to be asking ourselves. You know, I'm obviously going to try to answer that when I build out my list for 2022. But yeah, I had Juan Soto at four. MLB Network had him at five. I think going into next year, the question is simply, is he one, you know? And if you just take a look at what he did this year, I think probably the key number is is a 465 on base percentage. That is, I mean, that's otherworldly. There's really no other way of putting it. You know, that's, that's getting close to like, uh, you know, best since Barry Bonds type of levels of on-base percentage. And I love on-base percentage, so that's huge. He was uh, he was fifth in F4 uh, among the league, but obviously, you know, it's so tight up there with Turner at 6.9, Vlad at 6.7, Harper, Simeon, Soto, 6.6. The distinction is almost meaningless, you know, between, the, we're talking about decimal points of war. But yeah, I mean, Juan Soto uh, had an amazing year, and I think the most important development was not anything he did with the bat. It's the fact that he graded out as a plus right fielder when previously he'd been a negative left fielder. I think that completely changes his outcome in some ways because it just it squashes the doubts that like, oh, I love Juan Soto, but is this guy going to be a DH someday? If he can continue to play like that in right field, you know, the answer is obviously going to be no. And that's huge, you know. And it just kind of shows that moving to the position that he played primarily as a pro, like in the minors, uh, was very helpful for him. And it's going to be helpful for projecting him long term because previously he'd been seen as someone whose contributions were only going to be, you know, with the bat in his hands. And, and this, you know, ability to, to offer some defensive value, I really just think it changes his outlook. So Juan Soto, is he the best player in baseball? Is he not? You know, I think that's to be determined. But uh, a phenomenal season from him, and you know, obviously, I think this is just you know possibly the best young hitter uh, we've seen since integration. I mean, some of the numbers are astounding. Number three, Jacob Degrom. I'm pretty happy with the outcome from this one because basically, when I put Degrom at like three, and then Cole and Bieber at eleven and twelve, I was saying you know not only is Jacob Degrom the best pitcher in MLB. I was also saying, I don't really think it's that close. And I think this season really showed it. Obviously, you know, for DeGrom, he only got to start 15 games. He went out with injury. But when he played, I mean, he was I mean, he was gunning for, like, Bob Gibson and Pedro Martinez. That's how good he was. He had a 1.08 ERA and a 1.24 FIP. This was going to be potentially, like, an all-time type of season. And again, can't predict injury, you know, but you can try to predict performance. So... Uh, DeGrom, happy to have him at three. MLB Network also had him at three, but I will almost say 
if I had wanted to get DeGrom right, it might have been better to have him at two. You know, that's that's maybe the only other complaint, have him at two or one, because he was just so, so good when he played. You got to understand, this guy, um, you know, among pitchers, was still top 10 in F4, and he played half the season. He played half the season. He was still top 10 in F4. So that's how good he is. I hope he can just, you know, get back on track 2022 and and just do it for a full season. But, um, you know, the, the point still stands that I made uh, initially in March. Jacob deGrom is the best pitcher in MLB, and it isn't even that close. Number two, Mookie Betts. I actually think Mookie Betts is tough to rank. Maybe that sounds crazy. I, I You know, I said, and I still kind of feel this way, he's our generations like Roberto Clemente. That's who he is. It's just crazy defense in right field, really well-rounded player, hits for average. You know, he hits for more power, but honestly, this is an era of more power than, than Clemente's day. And so that's really how I see him. But I think as far as ranking him within MLB, he actually kind of makes it difficult because it's it's a little bit of the Freddie Freeman thing, I feel like, where... He's, he's generally just been really consistent. I feel like 2019, 2020, 2021, even like 2016, these are like very similar seasons overall. And then, but he did have the 2018. And the 2018, you know, MVP season, I mean, that might be the best season anyone put up that decade. It might be. I still think it's 2015 Harper, but that is clearly up there is what he did in 2018. And it's just a question of, you know, is he just going to always be, you know, this great player, or is there potential, you know, for him to thrust himself back into the conversation for best player in baseball? And I don't really know the answer to that. I think it's possible when I build out this list, he will drop a few spots, um, given that his his 2021 was what I would call really good, but maybe not great, you know? So uh, I think Mookie Betts is, is wonderful. He's a very well-rounded player, uh, and yet... Ranking him at two and MLB Network at two, I don't think that's necessarily uh, reflective of the landscape these days. I would still, you know, confidently put bets in the top ten. I would say, but but I don't know about two. I, I think you know if we're talking about a sort of a one A one B type situation, uh, you know, and then you know Degrom as well. Uh, there there's a clear cut top three with Soto, Trout, and Degrom. Which leads us to number one, Mike Trout. I had him as number one. MLB Network had him as number one. And, you know, going into 2021, I was still pretty confident, yes, this is the best player in MLB. Um, but I almost think the Aaron Judge, Giancarlo Stanton availability discussion has has sadly come for our boy, Mike Trout. This guy has played, you know, over the last, like, five seasons, less games than Giancarlo Stanton. It's true. You could look it up. He's played less games than Giancarlo Stanton over the last five seasons. So it is almost like, well, if he plays, I think he's the best player in baseball. But can you actually guarantee that he plays a full season? And I, it's sad that we're having this discussion. So I think with Trout, it would be helpful to remember the fact that, you know, in the 36 games he played in 2021, he was slashing 333, 466, 624, for a, a 1090 OPS and a 195 OPS plus. So he was he was really on one before the calf strain from hell came for him. You know, ultimately what this means is that I think Mike Trout is a great player when he's still on the field. I think, you know, on a, on a game-per-game game basis, you know, there's still a very good chance he's the best player in MLB, but you have to balance that out, sadly, with uh, what his availability could look like. Because Juan Soto, you know, plays full seasons. You know, he's and he's younger, and, you know, uh, past injuries don't always predict future injuries, but, I mean, Juan Soto, you know, 150 games in 2019, 151 this year, it's tough. And also, I will say this about Trout as well, you know, especially earlier in his career, a lot of Trout's value was derived from the fact that, you know, he was a, a quick defensive, like, center fielder who stole bases, which would say, you know, earlier in Trout's career, for example, it would be like him versus Miguel Cabrera or him versus like Joey Votto. And what kind of set him apart was he could hit, you know, in sort of the same range as Cabrera or Votto, but he would offer more because he could play center field and he would steal bases. And that those times are coming to an end because 
Honestly, long term, I think Brandon Marsh has a good chance to take center field away from Trout. So maybe he's a left fielder with some DH days and and the stolen bases. Mike Trout just doesn't he just doesn't steal bases anymore. He stole 30 bases in 2016. He stole 24 in 2018 and and 11 in 2019. And you know since uh, in his last you know 100 or so games or sorry his last 89 games so 2020 21 combined he has attempted four stolen bases. So that that facet of his game is gone. So he's becoming, I think, almost, you know, if he's a minus center fielder, right, and Soto's a plus right fielder, their defensive value might not actually be that different. So then it becomes a battle of the bats in a way. And I think Trout and Soto are very much, uh, you know, comparable as hitters these days. So um, this is all to say, look, I love Mike Trout. I think he's one of the best players to ever play the game. I think, you know, still in many ways, he is chasing down, you know, not just uh, his peers, you know, the players that are playing today, but he's the guy that is trying to chase down, you know, uh, you know, Ruth and and Mays and Aaron and, and Ted Williams, like he's trying to, you know, end up in that tier of players. And that's how I see him. He's trying to, you know, he still has a chance to be like the greatest player in baseball history is what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough. I don't know what I'm gonna do at number one next year. It's gonna take uh, a lot of examination. And I just think it would be uh, great for the game of baseball if Mike Trout could play a full season. You know, that's really all there is to say. So there you have it, guys. Those are the 50 people I had on the list. And, you know, before we uh, get going here, we got to talk about the big misses, the players that weren't on the list but should have been. So the obvious miss here is Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani was the best player in MLB this year. Between his pitching and hitting combined, he was worth nine reference war you can see above me where it says top one 8.1 f4 that's Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani was the best player in MLB this year period and looking at these numbers on his baseball reference page you can kind of see what I was thinking you know the two-way player thing hadn't really worked for him he hadn't really done it for more than you know a month and a half hadn't really you know pitched much in his MLB career at all to be honest with you and then 2019 2020 combined you know, he had hit okay. He was 259, 328, 466 for a 109 OPS plus. This is, you know, 150 games, 600 plate appearances. So good sample size. But the point is, if you're a DH putting up those numbers at the plate, you're not going to sniff the top 50. So, you know, and, and then what happens this year, he just comes out, has a, a historically great, unique year. Uh, everything goes his way. You know, he's a great pitcher. He's a great hitter. He steals 26 bases. It's insane. It's insane how good he was. Um, and I think... The lesson here with Otani is very, very clear. You know, he had like a very low floor because he could be, you know, replacement level or below that if he just, you know, couldn't pitch and then didn't hit well. But the lesson is simple. Here's the lesson. I'm I'm break it down. It's very simple here. The lesson is if a player's ceiling, we're talking about their ceiling, the absolute best they could do, if their ceiling is to be the best player in MLB, you have to rank them somewhere in the top 50. And that's where I messed up because I understood that. I knew that if Otani had this magical year, that he would be the best player uh, in MLB for that given year. And I still didn't rank him in the top 50 because I was so scared. I was like, well, there's a very high chance that he'll just blow up and, and he won't be anywhere near the top 50. So I think that's the key lesson. If someone's ceiling for a single season is to be the best player in MLB, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt and at least rank them in the top 50, even, you know, it doesn't matter how badly things went for them, you know, the season before. And then the other big miss that I'm kicking myself on is Marcus Simeon. And here's the thing about Marcus Simeon. Look at just sort of his uh, career progression. So he's a very average player until 2019. 2019, he has this crazy breakout year and he's third in MVP voting. And then in 2020, what happens? He just kind of, you know, falls back into the trend with Oakland. And then 2021, it's his 2021 is basically very similar to his 2019. You know, it's he's going to be a top 5 in MVP voting. He had this amazing year, let's see by F4, he was fourth. Yeah, I mean, he was like uh he was one of the top players in MLB in 2021. And here's why I don't like that I didn't rank Simeon. It's because I didn't give him the benefit of the doubt after he had such a great 2019. And I judged him more off of his small sample size 2020 and also these seasons. But honestly, these seasons are so long ago that they really probably shouldn't have mattered. So, you know, uh, here's here's a good comparison. I gave Cattell Marte the benefit of the doubt. And I don't, 
I don't regret it, but his career is basically the same thing, where 2019, breakout, top five MP, MVP voting, um, 2020, lull, go back to being average, and then 2021, when he played, again, it was back to that 2019 level, right? So if I'm willing to give Cattell Marte the benefit of the doubt and say, hey, Cattell Marte, I still think you're great because you had this great 2019, even though 2020 didn't go your way, why couldn't I have done the same for Marcus Simeon? Marcus Simeon should have been in the 40s on this list, uh, just you know, right around Cattell Marte level. And so that was a huge, huge mistake for me. Zach Wheeler had an amazing season this year. He's going to be in Cy Young contention. It's going to be him versus like Corbin Burns versus maybe Walker Bueller gets in there as well. But yeah, I think with Zach Wheeler, I was just uh, ignorant to what type of pitcher he was. I saw, you know, 6.7 strikeouts per nine, and then I pretty much just ignored him, even though his ERA was below three in 2020. When I was... Um, I had the, a couple people look at this list before I finalized it, and Jeremy Frank at MLB Random Stats actually recommended I take a look at Wheeler for a spot in the top 50, and I just kind of brushed it off, and uh, he totally proved me wrong. I mean, Zach Wheeler, I'm a guy who loves volume, and Zach Wheeler led in innings pitched, so, I mean, that's that's a miss. All the things I was saying about Aaron Nola were, were probably things I should have been saying about Zach Wheeler, so Zach Wheeler had an amazing year. And uh, this was, it was a bit of a miss for me, only because I think Jeremy brought it up, and then I brushed it off. I was like, no, I like, you know, player X and player Y and player Z way more. A few other position players like that where, you know, I can't really be critical of my process, but they were top 50 players would be like, you know, Brian Reynolds or Tyler O'Neill or uh, Cedric Mullins. Uh, fantastic seasons from those guys, uh, but, you know, I'm not really kicking myself for not putting them on the list. Um, there are some players like, I feel like Buster Posey here, you know, if I had given Posey the benefit of the doubt after, um, you know, giving uh, a year off in 2020 and, and just looking at what he'd accomplished in his career, you know, he'd, he'd been so great and then 2018, 2019 started to slip. It's possible if I was really, really ahead of the curve that I could have gotten in on Posey on the top 50, but I don't really kick myself for that one. Um, and then Kyle Tucker, Raphael Devers are a couple guys who I do believe were top 50 players in MLB this year, um, but just um, didn't show up on the list. And I considered Devers a lot. I almost had Devers at like 50 or 49. Tucker, not as much. So those are ones where I feel like I can be a little bit more critical. I should have really given Tucker uh, a closer look and, and Devers, um, you know, maybe should have given him that 2019 benefit of the doubt. You know, it's it's the same thing with... Um, you know, uh, Simeon and Marte, where Rafael Devers had a great 2019 sort of breakout and then, you know, wasn't nearly as good in 2020, but 2020 is a small sample size. So maybe I should have trusted, um, you know, the full season. And what do you do in 2021? Basically came back and had a season very similar to 2019. So uh, that's just a couple shout outs to some guys that I missed out on. With some, I can criticize the process. I've definitely learned lessons from Otani. I've definitely learned lessons from Simeon. Uh, did I learn lessons from Cedric Mullins? No. I mean, Cedric Mullins, uh, great breakout, but I, I was never going to see that coming in a million years, and I can't get too mad about it. So, Cedric Mullins, congrats on your great season, and guys, thank you for watching. Uh, we're going to have a follow-up to this where I really just sort of get into it and sort of decide who made a better list overall, me versus MLB Network. That's going to be sort of the grand finale, so... This was sort of my reaction just going back and looking at the list, but uh, there's still a little bit more playing around with the Foolish 50 to come. So I hope you guys are enjoying this type of content.